Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Gathering Church. I love this song so much. It's kind of been our rallying cry over the last few weeks because we believe that this is a season more than ever where we need to be reminded where our hope rests, where our hope lies, where our hope comes from. And I just think we just need as much of it as we can get in this season. And so I hope you're able to worship with us in hope this morning, specifically in the lane of hope this morning. So let's let's pray and, and then I've got something to share with you today. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for who you are. God, I thank you that you are hope. That Lord, no matter how dark it gets around us, no matter how 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 it feels, no matter what it looks like, what the outcome is, that you are always our source, our only source of hope. And we lean on you and we rely on you and we trust in you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, you can be seated for those of you standing up in your living rooms this morning. We are... uh, other Asheville offices. It's live, so anything can happen. We're excited about that. Such a big thanks to our production team, who are our essential workers during every part of this past year. And uh, they worked so hard to turn this office into a studio this past week, man. And we're so grateful for them. Well, hey, let me uh, let me just welcome you, whatever stage you're at, whether you're new to our church or just checking us out online, or maybe you've been a part of this family for a long time. I'm just so honored to have you with us. You know, we we love being able to worship together in person. We we are a community oriented church. That and I I mean that we are like a family. We love one another and we love to be together. And so I think for a church like ours, it's even harder in these seasons where we can't be in the same room together. But let me encourage you uh, to keep your Sunday morning habit. And so I'm talking to you, those of you who are listening to us on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday. Come on now. I want you to keep your Sunday morning habit because I believe it matters. You know, maybe you've got a COVID bubble, some close friends uh, who you've been keeping in your life during every season where we've kind of had to withdraw because of rising cases and filling hospitals. And maybe a a good way for you to worship on Sundays would be to have them over to worship with you on Sunday mornings. Or maybe it's just a matter of getting your family together and, and really engaging in the worship and leaning in, taking notes for the message and just doing your best to learn however you can and be a part of this Sunday morning habit. For us, Sundays are really about worshiping together and coming together as the people of God to proclaim what he's done and to learn about his truth and and really to give our friends an opportunity to experience Jesus for the first time. But it's also about giving God the first part of our week. You know, we believe in the principle of the first. I'm going to talk about that some today and And we're in 21 days of fasting and prayer right now because we want to give God the first part of our year. We're saying no to something physical so we can say yes to the spiritual and say, God, I'm giving you the first part of my year right now. Or or maybe, uh, you you know, we, we say yes to giving God the first part of our finances. Or we also say yes to giving him the first part of our week. And that's part of what Sundays are all about. So protect your Sunday morning habit. And in just a few short weeks, we'll be back together worshiping in person again, but we're just honored to have you. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, today uh, we're continuing our series, Do Over, and we're going to talk about something. We're we're a family here at The Gathering, and we're going to talk about something that I think most families don't talk about enough, and that's money, money. Because here's the thing, money is one of the number one causes of stress in our culture. It's in fact the number two cause of divorce in our country. Uh, Collectively, the U.S. has $712 billion worth of credit card debt. And the majority of Americans have less than $25,000 saved up for retirement, which is excellent if you're going to retire in 1935. Today, it's not going to take you very far. And all of that leads to one thing. Money is stressful. It gives us anxiety. It's something that we're weirdly quiet about. We protect ourselves about it. We don't want to talk about money. We don't want people to ask us about our money. And and it's stressful. And because it's stressful, in a stressful season, we tend to either really just not think about it at all, or we tend to abuse it. 
which means we get a little bit loose with it. And 2020 was one long, stressful season. It was this season that never ended. And and 2021 ain't looking too different so far. So maybe where you're starting with your money this year isn't quite where you want it to be. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about money. In fact, the Bible references heaven about 400 times. That's a lot. The Bible talks about heaven a lot and what's next for us a lot. But the Bible references finances and the management of finances around 2,000 times. So I think that gives us a good enough reason to talk about money today and a good reason to push for a financial do-over in 2021. When I was in my late teens and early 20s, I made about every mistake you could possibly make with money. I lived well outside my means. I didn't pay any kind of attention to how much I spent, so I would often run out of money long before payday. I remember the anxiety I'd get when I'd go to like the grocery store and go to swipe the card, and it's like roulette. You swipe that card, and you're like, here we go. Is it going to end? I remember the, the triumph and the joy when that thing said approved. You know, sometimes I'd be like, woo! You know, like I would literally celebrate in the grocery store. And I remember the sorrow and the embarrassment when it would say declined. And you'd have to go reach for that credit card or scramble around for a little bit of money in your pockets. Or maybe you've been here, have to walk away, leave the groceries on the belt. I remember that in those seasons, I would really rely on my trusty credit card to get by. That's right. When the money would run out, the credit card was always there for me. It was there to to be my best friend in those seasons. And I would use it to travel and to go on vacations. and, And then I would just go and make that minimum payment, minimum payment, minimum payment until one day the credit card stopped working. By the time Rael and I got married, I was a financial mess, and it took us years to sort it out. Maybe you can relate to part of that. Maybe you know what it feels like to live paycheck to paycheck. Maybe you know the groaning feeling you get when you realize it's a three-week pay period because it's a long month. And here's the thing. We try to make smarter decisions about money or to not think about money so much or to download an app to manage our money. But that stress that comes from money, that anxiety, that feeling, it finds a way in. Maybe you've never lived the way that I'm describing. Maybe you've always been frugal. You're one of those people who just was born understanding the value of a dollar. But if you're being honest, maybe you still think about money a little bit too much. You still feel if you just made a little bit more, you'd be more comfortable. Or you worry about how you're going to take that vacation that you already said yes to. Or maybe there's a million other reasons that we allow stress and anxiety to enter into our lives because of our finances. And maybe 2020 was worse than ever for you with the constant uncertainty of our economy and things really actually folding all around us, maybe that anxiety reached a maximum level in the last year. Here's what I want to say about our finances today. I think too often we address a spiritual issue by natural means. Too often we try to find the best practices instead of understanding the actual root cause behind the problem. Too often we try to get a self-help book to fix something only the good book can. And that's the most preachery thing I'm going to say today. I believe that financial stress and strain and the anxiety that comes from it is at its very core a spiritual issue. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5 is one of my go-to passages. I preach this, uh, I would say, 40 Sundays out of the year. It goes like this. For, those we, for, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And we demolish arguments in every pretension. That's lie that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive 
every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We can't keep thinking about money the way the world does. We can't keep fighting this war the way the world does. We can't keep attacking the anxiety of finances, the stress and the strain of it the way the world does because we have different weapons to fight in this war. Weapons that have divine power to demolish strongholds. So let's beat down some financial strongholds. Let's beat down some of the wrong thinking and let's get a do-over for our finances in 2021. Look with me at Luke chapter 16, verses 9 through 13. I want to kick it old school with the New King James Version today. I'm wondering about New King James Version. Is this like uh, there was like a uh, about past the collar ruffle time and maybe into the puffy shirt time? I don't know. Anyways, it goes like this. And I say to you, Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when it fails, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Let me explain for a second, because King James can be a little bit tricky. But I chose it because it's the only translation using that term mammon, which is what we find in the original text. So unrighteous mammon. Mammon, that Jesus said, the term that Jesus uses here, is what he's using to describe wealth. Wealth. Mammon is transliteration, which means it's a word they had in Greek in the original text, which there was simply no English word for, and so they just brought that word over into the English translation. Mammon isn't in the English language because mammon is a name. The name of the ancient God of riches. It was a Babylonian God who had stayed around all the way up into Jesus' time. People still believed in him, worshipped him. It was the God of riches. And I think Jesus chose to say mammon here instead of just saying money or wealth on purpose. I think, he, I think everything that Jesus said, he, he did it very intentionally. I think he understood the way that his words would be studied. In fact, I know that he did. And so it was all very intentional. And the reason that he says mammon instead of just saying money is because he didn't just want us to see the thing. He wanted us to see the spirit behind the thing. Sometimes things that we treat as natural problems are actually spiritual issues. And that means the things that we think are just a natural thing have a spirit behind them that would use those things for harm. In this opening sentence, Jesus is explaining a parable that he's just told of a shrewd manager who uses money for his own gain. And here he's explaining it by saying that We should take this thing, money, that has an unrighteous spirit behind it and use it instead in the name of righteousness. Use it to serve people. Use it to bless people. And then when that money inevitably fails you, fails you by deserting. How many of you know that money has no loyalty? Money has no, it doesn't pledge itself to you. Money will come and go no matter who you are. It'll fool you into abandoning your relationships and leave you all alone. And then if you've used this thing to serve others, once money has left you, you'll have somewhere to turn when it's gone. Let's keep going. Verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in in much. This is a simple financial principle that Jesus is talking about. I'll hit on this more in a moment. Verse 11, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? If you don't manage your money well, how can God trust you to manage things that really matter? Like people, like relationships, like a calling, like your purpose. And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Everybody serves something. No matter what you believe or don't believe, everybody serves something. Money, success, pride, Fear, mammon, but you only serve one master. And in this case, it's either God or it's mammon. 
You either submit your money to God or you submit it to mammon. And I fear that many of us have fallen victim to mammon, have believed the lies that he's been feeding our culture, have fed into it ourselves. And here's three of those lies that mammon wants you to believe. First, if I get enough, I will feel secure. Here's the truth I've discovered. The more stuff that a person has, the more stuff a person wants. Solomon, the great king of Israel, called the richest king who's ever lived by historians, discovered this as well in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. He says, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. We know that it's meaningless. But we still act like money is going to make us happy. We think we'll be less stressed if we just work out a few more hours. If we just work a few more hours or we think if we can get that promotion, our troubles will melt away. He says, goes on, the more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Isn't that the truth? I just think that's the truest thing that was ever written thousands of years ago. So what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? People who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much, but the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. Forbes did a study in 2016. I love to share this. You probably heard it before if you've been around, but they did a study with five separate income categories and they asked each of them what they defined as having enough money. And you know what they discovered? Every single category they asked to give an answer, every, every single category that they asked gave an answer that was almost twice as much as whatever they had. It didn't matter. It was the people who made 45000 a year said that it would be enough if they made $90,000 a year. The people who made $100,000 a year said it would be enough if they had $200,000 a year. The people who made $1 million a year said it would be enough if they had $4.2 million. Somehow, it just goes way up once you become a millionaire. It got worse the more money you had. And Solom- Solomon figured this out 3,000 years ago. And yet we still just buy into the same old lies. I believe that comes from mammon. And it's time to slay this spirit. Sometimes we just need to be reminded what it means to be content. To take inventory of what we have and discover that it's not our things or our stuff that gives us satisfaction. So we don't need to keep pursuing it. It's not bad to have stuff. It's bad when your stuff has you. The second thing is, We buy into this lie that I am what I have. The spirit of mammon wants us to define ourselves based on what we have. I think this is rampant in American culture. We define our class by our possessions. We even have a phrase for it. Keeping up with the Joneses. Listen, it's time to stop letting the spirit of mammon define us by how much we have or what car we drive or what kind of clothes we wear or how big our house is or what trendy neighborhood it's in. or When we believe this lie, it leads us to make stupid decisions with our money. Like pile on debt to buy a new car because our car is older than all of our friends. Or pile on debt to take a vacation because everyone else is going to the Bahamas and by goodness, it's your turn. Or buy more house than we can afford because we're adults and we got three kids and we got to make sure we have a thousand square foot per kid minimum. Got to keep them kids, we got to be able to social distance in that house. It's time to define yourself based on who God says you are, not on who mammon says you are. And the third lie that we believe is that if I have more, I will be happy. If I have more, I will be happy. We have a saying about this too. Money can't buy you happiness. But everyone's heard it, but hardly anybody lives like they have heard it. We let our financial stress drive us to this belief that if we can get ahead and get more, we won't be stressed about it anymore and we'll finally be happy. So we pursue this false happiness and we pursue it with vigor. We sacrifice time with our kids to buy more stuff that won't make us happy and won't make them happy. We work ourselves to the bone to get more money, to buy more things, to improve our station in life. Thinking that'll bring us some kind of joy or peace or end to this anxiety. But the problem is the natural physical aspect of money and provision. The problem isn't the natural side of it. The problem is the spiritual side of it. And it's the way we think about this thing called money. 
It's the way we serve the unrighteous spirit of mammon. Instead of making money, serve the purpose that God gave us. So today, I want to encourage you to break the spirit of mammon's control over your life. Decide that you're going to serve God and not mammon. Here's two simple ways that we can start that today. The first thing that we need to do is, is this. If you want to do over for 2020, very simply, these two things will get you there. Number one is just honor God with your finances. Just honor God with your finances. Our finances, how we manage them, what we do with our money, how we think about our money, all of it matters to God. The literal meaning in the moment in Luke 16.10 is that God is watching how you manage your money because that's how you will handle it if you're given a lot of responsibility, whether it's more money, people, purpose, calling. If you don't steward it well, if you aren't generous, if you can't control your spending when you have a little, you definitely won't control it when you have a lot. You can have a lot of money and be poor at the same time. Did you know that? Proverbs 28 verse 22 says, A stingy man hastens after wealth and does not know that poverty will come upon him. We can break the unrighteous spirit of mammon's control in our financial outlook by choosing instead to honor God with our finances. And that just means practicing simple biblical financial wisdom. There's a very practical side to this. Some basic principles, like don't get yourself into credit card debt. It's, this is the simplest principle I can give you today that will help you have a better financial year. Don't spend money you don't have. If you don't have the money, it's not time to buy the thing. If you haven't got the cash yet, you shouldn't borrow the cash. An emergency aside, and there's always exceptions to every rules, but if you're thinking to yourself, man, I'd really like to get myself um, a, a brand new, what is a thing that people buy? Maybe you're thinking to yourself, I want to get myself a, a brand new set of Nike baseball caps. Do they even make baseball caps? I don't know. Bear with me. It's an illustration. And you think to yourself, I don't have the cash for all of these baseball caps. Don't worry, I have a credit card and I'll pay it off later. This is the wrong way to think. Don't get yourself into bad credit card debt. Practice delayed gratification and save up for the thing you want. Now, if that thing's a house, you're going to have to get into some debt. But be wise with it. Seek counsel. Get advice. Have somebody tell you how much you can afford. Do all of those things. Practice biblical financial Wisdom. Proverbs 22 7 says, The borrower is slave to the lender. Don't get a lot of masters in your life that you're not prepared to serve. And then make a budget and live by it. And another principle is make a budget and live by it. Proverbs 21 5 says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance. But everyone who is hasty came only to poverty. This is about budgeting. This means when you're hasty with your money, when you don't pay attention to it, when you don't know where it's going, when you don't know where it's being spent, when you're just buying what you want, you will come to poverty. Budget every penny that comes in and out of your accounts. My family lives on less than 80% of what we make, and I believe that's a good goal for anyone. And so our budgeting process is very simple. First, we, we set our tithe, 10% or more that we give back. And then we take the next 10% and put that into savings. And then the rest, we budget wisely. Make a financial plan. Make a plan to get out of debt. Make a plan to bless others. Make a plan for every penny that you make through your budget. If you don't know where your money is being spent, it's very difficult to steward it well. Honor God by practicing wisdom. Honor God with your finances by practicing generosity. Christians should be the most generous people on the planet. Listen, this, this is just my per, a personal soapbox, so here I go. Nobody should give a bigger tip than Christians. Christians, you did not have to earn your salvation, so I do not believe your server has to earn their tip. Oh my goodness gracious. 
They just turned off the feed. It's over. Online church. It's easier to walk away when you don't like what he says. Listen to me. I believe that we should be leading with generosity. It's who we are as followers of Jesus. We are a product of generosity. Generosity should pour out of us. When we hear about a need, if we have the means to meet it, we should step up to meet it. When you've got somebody in your community, in your neighborhood, in your life group, in your group of friends who has a need, church, we show up. I think the gathering church is incredible at this. I always am hearing stories of the way that people showed up when someone had a need. And I think that this starts with small things like tipping. I think that uh, restaurants should be excited when the after church crowd comes in, not, not feeling like they're dreading it. Even on takeout, I think you should tip. I'm going to get off the tipping thing because I know I'm losing some of you. But yes, I think you should tip for takeout. I think you should always tip when the line says tip at the bottom. Bless people. Think of it as generosity. If we took the Bible's teachings on generosity to heart, I believe that there would be a lot less position for the government to stay, step in and take care of people. That's just how I feel. I feel like we should be the most generous people on the planet. We need to take care of each other. We give generously because Matthew 6, 21 says, where your treasure is, your heart will go also. I don't want my heart to be with my bills or my car, or my clothes, or my stuff. I want my heart to be with God. So if I lead with generosity, my heart will follow. Here's what I love about this verse. God is calling us to put what he considers treasure at the center of our hearts. He says he wants to trust us with true riches in Luke chapter 16. You know what God considers treasure? It's not gold. God paves the streets with gold. Gold's just asphalt to God. He thinks it looks nice when the sun hits it just right. People are the treasure to God. He trusts us with people. We need to invest what we have in real, actual treasure. Lead with generosity. Acts 20 verse 35 in the message version says, you'll not likely go wrong here if you keep remembering what our master said. You're far happier giving than getting. You will find joy and generosity once you learn to think right about your finances and stop serving the spirit of mammon. Honor God with your spending. Don't spend more money than you make and you'll be less stressed about how much you spend. And then here's the second thing we can do to break the power of mammon in our lives and I know you're used to three, but this is it. This is the final point today. And really what I, I believe, I truly believe from the bottom of my heart will give you a better chance at a financial do-over than anything else you can do this year. Return the tithe. The tithe is a hot topic. A difficult subject. We live in a culture uh, that is trained to challenge the status quo. And this is an area of the church that's been under scrutiny for years, not for bad reasons always. There's a lot of reasons for it. For one, trust has been broken. We've seen headlines of churches mismanaging our money and we wonder, should we trust churches with money or are we giving our tithe to God or are we giving it to flawed men? And here's my answer to that. God's called us to return 10% of everything we have. Jesus' plan to change the world is the local church. There is nothing that is better equipped to spread the message of Jesus and to do the work that he trained us to do in the world around us than his church. It's what he was training his disciples for. It's what he trusted to them. It's what he left for you and I to do. The local church is the hope of the world. When we give our 10% to the local church, we are giving to meet spiritual needs. And spiritual needs will always... Our church gives a lot to, to meet physical needs. We've talked a lot about that in the last few weeks. You guys are so generous and we meet a lot of physical needs with that generosity. But we believe that spiritual needs always outweigh our physical needs. If the church manages your tithe well, they should be meeting both physical and spiritual needs with greater impact than your 10% could ever make on its own. So give your 10% to the church. And if you don't trust the church that you go to, then it might be time to either ask some questions or find a different church. If you can't trust us with your finances, have a conversation. We're happy to talk about it. 
And if you don't trust us still, then you might need to find another church that you do trust. That's how important I believe this is for your life. Some people say the tithe is part of the law fulfilled when Jesus came, that in the same way we can eat all the bacon we want now, we also aren't held to the tithe anymore. Here's why I don't think that's the case. The tithe precedes the law. The law was given to the people of God around 3,500 to 4,000 years ago. But the tithe first shows up in Genesis a thousand years before that. Sacrificing the first fruits of your labor goes back to the first sons of Adam and Eve in the beginning of creation. The tithe is confirmed in the New Testament by Jesus and Paul. And I love this passage in Malachi that is all I need to know about it. Chapter 3 says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. I think that is such a beautiful promise of God that I think stands for every single one of us always. No matter how far you go in the other direction, how long it's been since you've trusted God, not just with your finances, but with your life, that he is always waiting for you to return. Because the moment that you return to him, it says he returns to you. It's the story Jesus told in the prodigal son. It's the story the Bible tells from start to finish. He is not angry with you, mad at you. He is not holding back judgment or vengeance on you because you had a bad financial year or a bad spiritual year. God is always waiting to return to you as a father who loves and cares for you. But you ask... How are we to return? And in this situation, God answers like this in verse 8. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse. Your whole nation because you're robbing me. And I think that this curse that he's talking about is something we experience today. When we're constantly overwhelmed by the anxiety of money. When the only thing we can think about is money. When money becomes our number one stress in life. When it's the thing driving our relationships apart. When mammon becomes the one that we serve and not God. And there's a cure for it. Verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And test me in this, says the Lord. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, there will not be room enough to store it. I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops. The vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. And then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. This is the only time in the whole Bible where God dares you to test him. Test me in this. Place your finances before God, before anything else, and you will make it clear who your finances are meant to serve. You will teach your heart not to idolize something as fickle as money. You'll break the power of mammon and its control over your life. And God will bless it. He's not saying you'll get rich. That's not how money works. You don't give money away and then suddenly you have more. You have less. It's, that's, how, that's how it works. But God is saying that something better happens for you. Something spiritual. Instead of living in scarcity, you begin to live in blessing and abundance. You can live without the pressure, without the stress. You can live without wondering if you're going to make it through till payday. You just got to get those priorities in order. It's the principle of the first. We got to start this year better than ever by giving God the first of everything that we have. The first of our year. The first of our our weeks. The first of our finances. Return the tithe. I've never spent money on the church. I've sown into it. I have invested in the eternity of others, in the spiritual health of others. And I would invite you to do the same. We could have a do-over on the financial errors that we made in 2020. It's not hard. We just have to stop treating our money like it's just our problem, our thing to think about, our thing to deal with, something physical. And we need to start treating this issue like it's a spiritual one. We need to put money in the right position in our hearts under the authority of God. And when we can do that, I believe that this can be your best year financially yet. Let me pray for us. Now, if you're here today, actually, 
And you, you have always been, you've had this anxiety, this stress around money all your life. And you just have never even thought about what it would be like to have that lifted. I'm telling you that the spirit behind the thing doesn't have to have control over you anymore. This is not a natural matter. It is a spiritual one. And the first step to solving any spiritual problem is Jesus. And so if you don't have a relationship with Jesus yet, let me invite you today to take that step and to take the first step into living the best year that you've ever had in your entire life, I promise you. And it's as simple as just saying yes. He doesn't need you to get it all straightened out right now. That comes later. First, you just start the relationship. And if you're ready to begin that relationship, would you just say this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for doing for me what I could not do for myself. Forgive me for trying to do this on my own. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my mistakes. Thank you for making a way for me to be in relationship with you, for forgiving me. I believe in you. I trust in you. And I invite you into my life forevermore. I give myself to you today. From this day forward, I am yours. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.